Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of The Ride. I'm Nicole. And I'm Michaela. And we are back this week. A uh, really exciting podcast. I am super excited to, to share this interview with everybody. Alex Bowens was uh, a cover girl of ours. She was on the fall cover of Horse and Rider last year. And we did a feature on her called Hashtag No Filter. And she is just a really cool person to follow on social media. She has a really big background showing horses in several different events, uh, the all around the reining and all that. But then she also does really cool things like mounted archery and she goes trail riding in um, the desert a lot and she documents it all on social media. So she has a huge following and we are so excited to get to talk to her and learn a little bit more about her. It's so hard to, uh, put somebody's entire story in two th- in two thousand words, like we have to do for the magazine. We're limited with space, so I'm really excited to really branch out from that feature and get you guys to know her better. Yeah, she's so cool. I really wasn't sure who Alex was until Nicole wrote the feature. She's being humble. She wrote the feature on Alex, and it is absolutely fantastic. So if you haven't read it. Be sure to check it out. It's online on our website, horseandrider.com. So you can read that there. But Alex is an absolutely amazing writer and artist. She started her social media because of her artwork. And now she is just a sensation. I love going to her social media and just watching all her videos and scrolling through her pictures because she's cool. She's stunning. Everything about her, I'm so excited for this podcast because I have not been able to talk to Alex personally. We've done a few Instagram takeovers with Alex, but it's just been a couple of text messages back and forth to prepare for that. So to be able to talk to Alex is super exciting. Yeah, and one other thing about that feature actually is that it was, uh, it's a finalist in the American Horse Publications Awards, and it's a finalist in the Best Personality. So Oh, uh, I think at the end of the month, actually, we'll find out if it is a winner or not. But it was just really exciting to have that feature make it into the finals of the AHP Awards because not only is Alex such an inspiration for people, she's so positive, she's so friendly, you know, she wants to make sure everybody feels included. And, you know, it sometimes people on social media can be really negative and there's you know, this persona where everything has to be perfect and everybody has to think you have this perfect life. And I love that Alex kind of does the opposite and shows goofy things and shows her mistakes and just shows her doing silly fun things. But uh, also Alex is an old, old friend of mine. We grew up showing together. We come from the same all around barn. And so it's just really cool to have a feature that means so much to me personally in the finals. So I I suppose we will probably announce if it does win in one of the future podcasts, but it's really cool to, to have that too. Super cool. It shows how talented of a writer Nicole is and how talented and amazing Alex is. And while we could just sit here and talk about Alex for the whole entire intro before we get on the phone with her and chat with her, let's dive into some current events. So um, more things are opening up. Obviously, most of us are still um, in, a, in a different world in the sense that like our, it's a new normal. That's what the word keeps going around, new normal. So things are opening up, but there are still a lot of precautions put into place. Horse shows are starting to happen. I know we talked about in, in a previous podcast, Michaela went to a barrel race. So those are still going on here in Colorado. I've seen a couple of big horse shows have announced that they are going to continue the Red Bud Spectacular, which is one of AQHA's largest uh, events is in Oklahoma City. I think it's the first week of June, maybe. So coming right up, but they're going to hold their horse show. I saw a press release from the NRHA Derby that they're going to continue forward with their uh, Derby at the end of June. So it sounds like horse shows are starting to come back to the surface and people are starting to leave their houses again. And uh, it's just, I hope that everybody stays safe when they're there and they enjoy their time at the horse shows. I know that you've had quite the experience doing the social distance thing at um, your barrel races. Ben a little different going to the barrel races I discussed before what it was planned out to be like but going and actually doing it is a totally different 
world and set up, but I really, really like the way that they were set up in time sessions. I don't know if they're going to keep going forward with that like I had hoped because it seems like it's a little bit of a challenge for some of the producers to be able to keep up with that. I'm excited to see the changes that all the horse shows and different events are making to keep up with the different changes and the rules that are being put into place because I know that some of the barrel races that have been put on have had over 400 entries. That's really challenging to be able to social distance with 400 people at one facility. So I just think it'll be really interesting going forward. And then another thing is the virtual horse shows, you know, where those are going to go, whether those stay a thing because, you know, it's been a fun thing for those people who don't have the means to be able to go and show. So I think it'll be super interesting to see if those stay in place and have a place in the equine industry. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, like Michaela and I were talking off air, uh, there's a lot of social media fatigue, computer fatigue. You know, I think everybody is just tired of being stuck inside and staring at their computers all day. So it would be interesting to see how the virtual horse shows do once that initial fatigue wears off, I guess. Um, And, you know, going down the road, if people do prefer to do the virtual thing over the regular horse show thing. Yeah, I know personally, I just, you just can't be going to an event and competing and being in that atmosphere. There's just something about the atmosphere that makes it what it is and so much fun. And then, of course, being around your friends and family just adds to all of the things that make showing horses and being around horses what it is. I am just super excited that I get to ride again. I have been going out to the barn as much as I can. Uh, We worked cattle the other day, and the horse that I ride, he is a really, really cool little cow horse. He has like $50,000 in lifetime earnings, and he is just hanging out at the barn, and they just needed someone to come ride him, so I've been trying to get him in shape. So that's that's been my biggest challenge as of recently is just trying to to get him uh, legged back up. It seems that the coronavirus kind of pushed back what would normally be spring conditioning. So now we're trying to make up for lost time. Yeah, and hopefully you'll be able to reap the rewards with that, though, and see his progress as you start to leg him up. I know personally, I love watching my horses go from their winter body shape to summer condition because, wow, especially my horse, my mare that I run barrels on, she gets super muscled up. So it's awesome to see the difference in her. So hopefully you'll be able to see that difference with the horse that you're riding. Yeah, I think it's it's definitely really fun when they shed out their winter coat and you start to see the muscle and their you know hair is nice and shiny and pretty. And so, yeah, looking forward to that. You had a little bit of a scare the other day with your red mare, though. Yeah, um, kind of my first experience with this. I mean, I have owned horses my entire life. And this is the first time this has happened. And I actually went out to the pasture to catch my horse because the farrier was on his way. And I get out there and she's showing some symptoms that I had never seen before with some nasal discharge and the way she was holding her head and she wasn't able to walk correctly. So immediately, of course, I called my vet to see what was going on got a hold of him. He wasn't quite sure what was going on. So he came out and sure enough, it was a case of choke. And then on top of that, with all of the stress and some dehydration from the choke, she was starting to colic as well. So definitely a scary moment. She had a few tears because one day she was normal. And I mean, that morning she was normal. And then I went out to the pasture and I, of course, like I said, I'd never seen any of those symptoms before. So I wasn't sure what I was looking at exactly. So it was definitely really scary, but now I know the symptoms. So I think that that's something that, you know, you learn as a horse person, you read about all of these different medical experiences and different cases and all of those different things but you don't really put everything together until it happens to you. 
Yeah, I, you know, in all the years that I've been around horses, and I've been around horses, my, like, I'm not lying when I say I've been around horses my entire life. I grew up with horses. I was showing my whole life. I've been working with different trainers and different barns. I've never had one have choke before. So that would be really scary for me too. I've, I've definitely had them show signs of colic and all that fun, you know, not so fun stuff, but, um, I've never had one have choke. So that sounded really scary, but, uh, all is good. Michaela passed out afterward from the sun and the heat, but, uh, she is alive and well, and just another funny story to, to add to, to life. Yeah, it was actually a funny story. Nicole mentions me passing out. So I guess I'll kind of jump into a little bit more of the story because it's actually hilarious looking back on it because my vet was in the middle of tubing my mare and I look over at him and I say, I am so sorry, this is going to sound really strange, but I'm seeing some patches of black, so I need to sit down. And thankfully, of course, my mare was sedated because she's not the nicest mare for vets to deal with. So she was, you know, good for him. I stood up a few times and then had to sit back down again. And I am so thankful for my vet. And I was really worried that I would never be able to contact him again because this is the most embarrassing story of my life. So he finishes up with her, puts her away, tells me that she's going to be okay and that he's going to check on her again in just a little bit. But first he wants to get me into the house. So he asks me if he could carry me and of course I say no because I mean who wants their vet to have to carry them into the house so he walks next to me and the next thing you know I fall on the ground and a few moments go by that are a little blank (laughs) and then I come back to and have some other experiences that I will not share on the podcast (laughs) because that's a little bit too much And so I come back and he asked me if he could carry me back into the house again. And I said, well, actually, I'm feeling a lot better now. So he helped me up and walked me to the house again. And we went on our little way. But I'm sure that I will go down in the history of vet experiences that he was not expecting. So be one of those holiday stories that my vet tells, I'm sure. (laughs) It's only funny because everything is okay now. Yes. Yeah. Had everything was good. He actually called me this morning to check on not just my horse, but me to make sure that we were both okay. He sounds like a really good vet. So hopefully he will come back to help you in the future. Well, he keeps saying that if I have any problems to give him a call. So I'm sure that I didn't scare him too bad. Just another day in the life of a vet, I'm sure. So with that being said, I want to know that if anybody else has any funny stories like this, we, of course, want to hear about them. Share them with us all the ways that we tell you to and all the other podcasts, horse and rider at aimmedia.com on social. Tell us your funny stories. But from here, we're going to dive into this interview and chat with Alex. All right, so today we are joined with Alex Bowens, who some of you guys on Horse and Rider are probably familiar with her. We have featured her on our Instagram account. She's done a couple takeovers for us. And she was also, like I mentioned earlier, the cover girl of one of our issues. And we've done a feature with her. But we just wanted to, uh, you know, take a deep dive into who she is. It's really hard to to really tell a person's whole story in the magazine. And so we're super excited to have Alex here. Thanks, Alex, for joining us. Hi, thanks for having me. So before we get started in the interview, we like to do a little lightning round of questions. And they are a little bit of everything. They're horse related. They're just random stuff. And I think it just kind of helps people get to know who you are as a person. So let's dive in. So, Alex, what is your favorite trick that you can do on horseback? I think my favorite trick is probably the jumping jarmaki. So that's the archery trick where I'm jumping the horse over a fence 
and then I put the bow behind my head and shoot at a target. Um, it just has so many moving parts to it, and it's my most challenging trick. So I think once I finally got that and I could hit the target, I was really uh, excited and proud of that. Yeah, your tricks are super fun to watch on social media, and we'll dive into that a little more during the, the interview portion. But um, so the second question is, who's your all-time favorite horse? It could be a really famous horse that's not even in the, the industry that you grew up in or ride in or just any of them. Uh, I think you probably know my answer to this. It's going to be Miss Dreamy. <laughs> so my trainer, Dan Huss, showed Miss Dreamy at the World Equestrian Games. Um, she, she got a gold and silver medal. And then she did the unforgettable world show run where her bridle broke. And he finished the pattern. And it was extremely inspiring. So I think that kind of inspired not just me, but people across so many different disciplines. So she's she's a really amazing horse. I mean, Nicole, you've met her. And you've kind of seen firsthand that she's a really sweet mare and she's just an incredible performer and I'm a little yeah. biased because it's my trainer riding <laughs> Alex and I probably fight over who is the president of her fan club yep definitely <laughs> now what is your favorite music genre Ooh, that's a tricky one I think I listen to all different types of genres depending on what I'm doing so if I'm riding or painting or running so lately I've been listening to a lot of dance music uh, but generally I go to like I, I want to say like indie folk maybe so it would be um, Gregory Allen Isakov is one of my favorites or any I don't know what genre Lana Del Rey falls into but she's another go-to um, okay so what is your favorite place to travel to uh, my favorite place would be Kaolak Thailand that would probably be number one it's, it's a tie though with Barcelona Spain both beautiful places yeah that sounds amazing yeah absolutely those I've never been to either one of them but I've seen some pictures and seen some of your social media and I would probably kill to be able to go there we're on a whim and uh, a little bit like unplanned trips or spontaneous trips but really pretty places I would I would highly recommend visiting both when we can travel again <laughs> right of course so last question, what book are you currently reading? Um, I just started Gates of Fire by Stephen Pressfield. Um, that's about the Battle of Thermopylae. Uh, it's a lot about the training and discipline of the Spartan warriors against the Persians. So that's where the Spartans had 300 men versus um, the 2 million Persians. So it's uh, just kind of a motivational book, I guess. But I just finished his other book, War of Art, which was really good. So that made me want to read um, Gates of Fire. And then I'm also listening to Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone again, because J.K. Rowling's offering it uh, through the Wizarding World website. So those are all yeah. my books. I usually do like three books at a time. So <laughs> I love it. You're much better um, than I am. I can only read one book at a time. I get so into it that I'm like, this book is my life right now. <laughs> right. I get like that too, but then I get really sad when they're about to end. So if I kind of rotate, then it doesn't feel so bad. I can be like, okay, I don't want to finish this last chapter because I want it to continue. So I'll just switch to another book and then wait like two weeks and then finish the other. <laughs> I love it. Um, no, those are all really cool sounding. I'm going to add them to my list. I know we tend to talk off air about you saying that you had a couple books that I would enjoy. So oh, yeah, I think gonna, you'd love Gates gonna, of Fire. Yeah, I'm going to check it out. It sounds really good. Anyway, let's get into the real interview. Those are just some fun questions to kind of break the ice. So... I think I should probably preface this by saying Alex and I have known each other for 15 years now, maybe, yeah. maybe a little less, maybe a little more. Um, we both grew up in the same industry. We're both from uh, the Chicagoland suburbs and we showed together, we rode together. Uh, since then we've kind of, you know, changed our career paths and, and riding paths and all that fun stuff. But let's go back to how you originally got into horses. You started in the English world with your mom, but your mom had a really bad accident that made you guys decide to switch to the, to the Western stuff. Yeah. So I started riding when I was three. Um, my mom had a hunter jumper and she ended up, I think I was eight or nine when she had her bad accident. Um, she was at a horse show and she, her horse dropped a toe on the first fence and then kind of stumbled and she fell in front of him and then fell through the fence. It was, it was not a pretty sight. Um, and so she, I wanted to keep jumping, but she wanted to maybe go in a different direction because she was in the hospital for a bit and 
kind of recovered from that accident. Um, and so she, my grandma actually had bought a horse from an all around trainer and I was having a lot of fun on that horse. Um, it was our first full quarter horse and uh, I was doing, like I was doing rodeo stuff with him. I was doing jumping, like we were just having a blast. We contacted the woman who sold him to us and, or to my grandma. And we just asked, hey, do you have any other horses? And we ended up going over there and kind of doing like a mini audition to ride with her. And that's when we switched to the all around and strictly did quarter horses and the all around events. Yeah. And, and you were fairly successful in the all around stuff. I mean, I, we both grew up <laughs> together and like, I think you and I were probably, we were probably competing against each other the entire time. Oh, always, and, right? Yeah. It was really, it's, it's really fun to, to look back now because there's such a different perspective. Yeah. Yeah. It is funny to kind of look back and see, but I mean, we, we were traveling all the time. I think at one point I missed like over a hundred days of school to go to horse shows. And I know you were at probably all of those horse shows with me. Um, yep. so that was, yeah, things have changed since then, but that was a really fun time, I think. Uh, and then kind of towards the end of your, your youth career, you kind of stumbled into the reigning stuff. Yeah. So my grandpa, uh, he was, I think, seeing how much my grandma was riding and he was like, I'm going to get into riding. So he didn't start riding until he was 50 and neither did she. And so he decided that he wanted to get into reining. So he was the first one to do reining in our family. And he had this kind of sassy black mare. And so he, at one point decided he wanted to sell her because she um, kind of hurt his back a little bit. And so, you know, the 15 year old hustler in me said, Hey, I, uh, I would love to um, try to help you sell her. And uh, so he, I said, I could show her in the youth classes and then market her, you know, at the Congress. And so my first reigning show was actually at the Congress on this mayor and they were putting up flyers to sell her. And I was just like taking them down. I didn't want to get rid of her. So my mom ended up buying that horse for me from my grandpa. And then she took my all around horse and started showing him and she won the Congress with him and did really well. So it all kind of worked out for the best, but that's how I ended up getting into reining was really through my grandpa. But, um, you have a really funny story about how you actually got on a rainer for the first time, because we were talking about this at a different time. You and I both have experiences where we start out not knowing anything about an event and just get thrown on a horse that happens to be like world famous. <laughs> yep, exactly. Yeah. The first time. So my grandpa was riding, um, at the barn where smart like juice was and, they said to me, Hey, do you want to get on this really famous stud? And I was like, yeah, why not? And so of course that was like one of the best horses I could have <laughs> been introduced to the sport of reining with. Um, and so that was, uh, that was probably the beginning of the addiction. And then my grandpa said, you know, you did a good job. You can get on my mare. So hook, line and sinker. Oh, totally. <laughs> I was, I was done after that. Then... Pretty memorable moment. So, you know, how, many other memorable moments do you have in the reigning arena or what's your most memorable moment? Is that your most memorable moment? Tell us a little bit about that in the reigning pen. Yeah. My most memorable moment. Um, the first one that comes to mind is competing at the, uh, North American youth championships. And that was in 2009. And so it was going to be my last show, my last big show. Um, my horse had, he had been injured right before that. So I had qualified to represent the state of Illinois for the um, North Central team. And I wasn't able to show my horse. And luckily with those FEI rules, I could show someone else's horse, but the only horse that was available to me uh, was one that was in Ohio and I couldn't actually ride until the show. Um, I think I went once to Ohio to practice on him. It was, he's a big time bingo. It's one of uh, Rick Kristen's horse too. So he, um, he let me, he was very kind of him to let me show that horse, but I was basically catch riding because I got to the show in Kentucky in Lexington. And I think I had two practices before going into the show pen. And <laughs> I, we actually pulled a shoe on both of those practices. So I never got a chance to do a sliding stop until the actual show. It's not like until we were in the arena competing. And it was so fun because we were working with a team. And so, you know, Nicole, like you don't often, 
growing up, we didn't work on teams a lot. Like we were always competing by ourselves. And so this was the first time that I really was able to compete with a team and have that camaraderie. And that was really rewarding. So we were all rooting for each other. You know, they kind of treated it like a mini Olympics where they had um, uh, a chef to keep. Isn't that what it's called? Yeah. Yeah. It's been a while now, but yeah, they had uh, an an award ceremony and we had, um, you know, we had to get on a podium. And so we ended up uh, taking home the gold, which was super exciting. And um, we just had a wonderful time at that show. And it was really nice to kind of root for other people that were competing with you, you know, even rooting for the other people that were competing in the other divisions was super fun because we got to see the show jumping. And yeah, that was that was definitely one of my most memorable shows for sure. It sounds a lot like the World of Equestrian Games, which is what I got to attend in 2018. And yeah, it's it's so different. And it's really cool to see people from all over the world. I mean, there were like, I think I don't know, more than a hundred plus horses flown in for this. And it's just, it's crazy. So neat. Yeah. yeah. It, and yeah, you learn so much about all the different countries and their styles of riding and, and all it of that. It was really cool. I loved, like we bonded with like the Mexico team a lot. Like they would teach us things and like silly dances and they had all of these like fun activities. It, it really did feel like a mini uh, wag in a way, but that was, yeah, I wish, um, I wish everyone could have that experience because it was really special. You had a really good support team too. You, uh, okay. your trainers, Dan and Wendy Huss, I know that you've kind of talked about them a little earlier, but that's who really got you introduced to the world of reigning and really helped you blossom your career and get to that point. Absolutely. Um, they've been like my two best mentors and trainers, hands down. Um, before I met Dan and Wendy, I had seen them at uh, horse shows because they were in the Midwest as well. They were in Illinois and you know they had a another student that was my age and they just did a really good job. I kind of eased off on their lessons and I was like, I really like how they're teaching. And I ended up uh, moving my horse over to them. And, you know, before riding with them, I, I was not able to count my spins. I was over spinning. I was really nervous in the show pen. I kind of had a trainer at the time that was making me really anxious and, um, the great thing about Dan and Wendy, if you don't understand what they're saying the first time or the second time, they find a different way to tell you how to do it. So they're always adapting to the rider and they're adapting to the horse. So I really like that. And it's been something that I've implemented throughout everything in my life. Like if someone doesn't understand what you're saying, you might have to adapt the way that you're telling them. Yeah. And Dan and Wendy, I mean, our, the horse and rider audience is very familiar with them. We've used them multiple times. We have, you know, we have a great relationship with them as contributors. And yeah, like you said, they, the way that they treat the horses and the horse showing and work with these non pros is just so wonderful. And so, yeah, our, our audience should be very familiar with them. Yeah. I would um, recommend if they, if anyone in your audience isn't familiar, just to Google like Dan Huss mystery me ride to see like the bond that he has with his horses that he trains because not anyone can have a bridal break in the middle of a world show final and finish the pattern and score better than (laughs) if you had a bridal. I mean, it was just absolutely amazing, but they really, they're really good horse trainers and they're the reason I've been able to adapt to different breeds and to different styles of riding because they have such a strong foundation. So you can kind of apply that foundation to so many different types of horses. Yeah, and um, you can actually learn more about that particular ride on horseandrider.com. I had the chance to sit down and talk with them because who doesn't want to know all about that day? It was inspirational. So you mentioned how Dan and Wendy also are from the Midwest, and they now live in Arizona. You live in Arizona. So what was the reason behind you moving to Arizona, and how awesome is it to be able to, you know, still ride with Dan and Wendy? Oh, it's amazing. It's a dream come true. We started coming out here when I was 10 uh, with my all around trainer for the Sun Circuit show. And so I just remember looking around being like, I would love to live here one day. It was so fun to ride out here. And then I think it was about 10 years ago that Dan and Wendy made the move and they made the move a few years before I did. And so I would come out and visit them and continue riding. Um, And then eventually, I think it was about six or seven years ago, I ended up moving down here. And yeah, it's been great to be able to continue riding with them and learning from them and in a new environment as well. I mean, you can't really beat the weather out here. I love Chicago, but the weather here is kind of (laughs) crazy. 
Right. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you about what it's like living in Arizona, because that is one of the dream places that if I could just pick a place on the map, I would love to live in Arizona. So can you just talk a little bit about that and the trail rides? Because your social media is amazing with the trail riding views that you share. So I would love to hear a little bit more about that. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I think Nicole did a good job of capturing some of those for the uh, horse and rider article. Um, the trails out there out in the desert are just absolutely beautiful. Um, it was definitely my dream place to move to. I was like, where would I want to retire? Let's just move there. <laughs> but the the summers can get hot, but we just wake up earlier and, um, you know, get our stuff done early in the morning and there's a nice cool breeze. I went for a run at 530 this morning and it was 57 degrees and it could get up to 100 during the day, but if you wake up early enough, it's really not that bad. Well, when I visited Scottsdale, I go there a lot for work. And one of these trips, I got to meet up with Alex and we went on a trail ride with some of her really good friends, Tina and Steve, who were so nice to let me borrow one of their horses and go into the desert. And we got to see wild horses, which I have, I mean, I know in Colorado, we have some wild horses, but not nearly as many as they do in Arizona and all that. And that was seriously one of the coolest moments I've ever had, like being around horses and the wild horses and just all of it. Yeah. Arizona is amazing. It's kind of like time stops when you see a wild horse too. Like it's just, it's so magical and we run into them all the time out here. And there's also, you know, remember Nicole and we went through that like little river creek area and then you didn't know if there was like a bobcat and all the horses started kind of getting nervous and we had to turn around. That kind of stuff too happens all the time on the trails, which I personally kind of love because it makes it so exciting. Like it's just, there's never a dull moment. We've run into eagles and steer, wild steer, which is random, um, and uh, rattlesnakes and you name it, we've seen it out here. Yeah, I think I remember that because we were in the wash and all the horses were getting like super antsy and nervous. And yeah. But it's so true. It, it almost like it just feels so you're like in the wild and you're in yeah. nature and it's like this is real life. You know, Absolutely. you can't you can't control it. It was super cool. Yeah, it's it's kind of like um, you go back in time a little bit. You also have a pretty funny story about running into some wild horses while you're horseback, right? Oh yeah. The first time I ever ran into them, <laughs> um, I, I wasn't even living here yet. And Dan and Wendy were nice enough to let me come out and ride. And I stayed with them for a few weeks and I got finished riding and practicing with Dan for that day. And I was on a very nice stud and I said, Hey Dan, can I take him out for a little trail ride? And this is pre iPhone era. Um, I think I had a little flip phone with me that was probably on 10% battery and I didn't bring any water with me or any food. And I was like, I'm just going to go for a quick trail ride. And I ended up going down uh, to get to the trail. I had to like go down a little, it's like a little sand, like a little sandy hill and then go back up and go through the fence and go through trees. So when I came back, it was completely covered. So when I was going, I could see it just fine. But when I was coming home, you couldn't find it anywhere. And, you know, that's kind of how it is in Arizona. It's like you can see things one way and then when you turn around and you're like, I'm not quite sure where I am. So I uh, I got lost for about two and a half hours on that ride. And <laughs> yeah, it was starting to get late. And I thought, oh, Dan's going to kill me. But I came back and, you know, he was like, oh, you know, you went a little longer and didn't care at all. But when I finally found the trail, like I remembered by the end of it, I was like, if I put my hand down, the horse can take me home. Like they'll be able to figure it out. So this horse like navigated back. We ran into wild horses on our way back. Um, and he was a stud and I just see another big stud staring right at us in a wash and like start snorting. And I'm like, we got to get out of here. So we like took off in one direction. And then I was like, okay, I'm so lost. I put my hand down and I just kind of like let him lead the way. And he eventually found the trail. Cause I, I wasn't trusting it. I was like, Oh, I don't think he's taking us in the right direction. And sure enough, I was just able to see like a little inch of the fence and I got home and it was like, it was so exciting when I found that I felt like I won the lottery. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of inspired your love for trail riding too, right? It really did. It, it gave me that same feeling of being in a horse show where, you know, you get that adrenaline rush and being out on the trail, I had that same feeling. So I was like, I would really love to do more of this in my life. Yeah, so you moved to Arizona. Did you know what you wanted to do with your horse life when you moved out there? Obviously, you 
we're in the all around in the raining. You fell in love with trail riding. So what was kind of your plan when you moved to Arizona? Yeah. So when I moved out there, I had just sold my last show horse. So I knew that um, showing was going to be on the back burner and I probably wouldn't be doing that for quite some time because I was really focused on my art career and I just wanted any excuse to ride. I mean, you know, I know we've talked about this before where when you love riding horses, you'll take pretty much any opportunity to do it. And so I was mostly um, focused on just getting back to riding and kind of offering up like, Hey, if you have something to ride, let me know. Uh, Dan and Wendy were always gracious and let me ride any horses that they had. And, um, I knew I was going to be doing more mounted archery too, because, uh, the mounted archery facility is out in Arizona. So I knew that was on the plan too, but, um, it just kept evolving from there. So you kind of talked about mounted archery, explain to us how you actually got involved with it, because it's so different from anything else that you've probably done in your riding career. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was really by chance. I, I knew that I wanted to do something fun. I had just sold my last Rainer, like I was saying, and I thought, you know, it might be a good time for a change and try a new sport. And so in my mind, I thought mounted shooting sounded like a really fun idea. And we were driving back from the barn. I'll never forget. It was on Rio Verde Road. And I was with my mom and we saw a truck that said mounted archery lessons and then a phone number. And she's like, write that number down. And so I was like, oh, I don't know. And so we followed this truck. I wrote the number down. I called this woman, Di Troik, that evening, and I set up a lesson with her. And this was before I moved to Arizona. This was just on vacation here. And I took a lesson with her, and um, I was hooked by the end of that. It was just so much fun. I mean, I even had, like, blood blisters because I was doing it wrong. And I called her. I was like, I want to come back tomorrow. I've got these blood blisters, but I'll just work through it. <laughs> so I, I knew I was, I was hooked after that. And for anyone who hasn't seen Alex's mounted archery and all of the cool shots that she does, be sure to go to her social media and you can see all of her cool things that she does because they are stunning, amazing, and I just sit for minutes and hours just dreaming about how cool she is and scrolling on my phone I'm like wow Alex is the coolest <laughs> oh you're making me blush thank you <laughs> it's so it's kind of funny because um our senior editor Jenny Forsberg Meyer she mentioned at one time she's like my friend follows this girl who like shoots bows arrows off the back of her horse and she's really <laughs> cool on Instagram and I was just like I know her <laughs> that's so I grew up with her <laughs> yeah. that's so it's funny just, it's, so fun like the your social media reach has been insane with like reaching the horse population but you you post such cool I mean cool content like we're we're all content creators here and I have so much respect for people who create such you know really fun content on social media that's not the norm to what you see and I kind of talk about this in the feature that I did on you because I think that's a really important thing is that your social media presence is so different from those who try to represent like this perfect life and this perfect, you know, lifestyle and the perfect barn and the perfect horse and, and all that. And you're just, you're having fun with it. And so how did, I mean, how did you even get started on the social media journey? You have like a hundred thousand followers on multiple platforms, right? Yeah. I think, I think it's about that now on Instagram and TikTok. And thank you. That's really kind of both of you to say, and you know, it was never, I, I'm kind of always of the philosophy of like, nothing's perfect, nothing's easy. And it's, it's okay to show your flaws and to show, you know, some of the struggles. And then it's also fun to make cool videos. I know we kind of grew up in like a music video era and I always thought it'd be so cool if there were more horse videos. <laughs> and so I just started making that. Um, and when I moved to Arizona, I just, it was a way to keep in contact with my friends in Chicago. And so I would post like trail riding pictures and because of my background in art and I really like strong composition, which translates into photography. Like, you know, um, I was taking pictures, just casual pictures with my phone of the horses on trails and then posting those. And then it was eventually leading to meeting so many cool people through uh, social media where I would actually meet up with them in person. And we've now, you know, some of these people I've been friends with for five plus years. And it's crazy to think that we met through a social media platform. And we say how you have so many followers and how cool you are on social media, but you kind of did it on accident, according to Nicole's profile on you. It was just you started posting really cool things and people started to follow you. And this isn't something that you started because you wanted to gain the social media following. 
Absolutely. I think that's something that's really important that I'd like to kind of tell younger kids about, um, that it's not necessarily about quantity, it's about quality. And I hear a lot of kids now saying, I want more followers. How do I gain more followers? And that really shouldn't matter. Um, it should be more about what you're trying to put out into the world and what message you're trying to send to other people. And that will connect you with like-minded individuals and kind of lead you to the places that you want to go. So I don't really think it's that important to have a mass following. I mean, that's wonderful when people do have a lot of followers, but um, I do really think it's more about the quality and and what you really want to achieve. I think that's what I really like about your social media, though, is that it's organic. It's not posed. It's not hashtag doing it for the gram. You know, it's it's really just what you're doing. And people just enjoy that. And I think that's the most important thing about social media. And like I mentioned earlier in the profile, we talk about how, you know, not everybody's so worried about being perfect and, and looking apart on social media. And I think you're doing a really great job of showing like, hey, sometimes I fall, you know, when I'm trying to do this silly trick on my horse, or sometimes I'm going to play soccer and, you know, go for a walk around the neighborhood or just like, you know, put a chicken next to my horse and see <laughs> what it's going to do. You know, like it's not, yeah. it's not like, um, you know, sometimes I think the really big problem with social media now is especially young girls, they have this, you know, they see all these people on Instagram and they look apart and you think that you have to be like that. And you're kind of proving like, I'm just having fun. <laughs> yeah. I think it comes down to having fun. I mean, at the end of the day, that's what a horse life should be is, is having fun and building a connection and trying to grow with your horse. And it's never perfect. I don't care who, you know, who you're looking at on social media, if they look like every ride is perfect, that's not even something to envy because that's a pretty boring life to have them if every single ride is is perfect so I try to just be genuine and share you know that I miss more times than you realize and that <laughs> I fall off doing tricks and you know I also want to tell people to be safe but that hey life happens and mistakes happen and um, just try to be real yeah I think I think it is important to say that you are very safe in what you're doing and you're, you know, around other people who know what they're doing and you're in, you know, a safe environment. But yeah, that's, it's just, it's fun to see people who are not at their best because that's all of us. <laughs> oh yeah. And I like my favorite things to edit too. I don't know if you saw the video I posted, I think it was like last week where it, it says like what people think my horse life is like versus what it's actually like. And it just fails. And I just sat there laughing so hard at myself, just messing up because it just gives me so much entertainment. Like, I don't know why I, I really like get my kicks off of that, but <laughs> I think it's more entertaining. <laughs> With that many followers, you know, a lot of people will come for you saying, well, did you really hit that target? She, there's no way she can do that. How do you handle that? And what kind of advice would you give other people on social media for being able to handle comments that aren't so nice. Yeah, that was one comment that really, I get it all the time. I mean, I don't, I'm very lucky. I don't get a lot of negative feedback, but I do get a lot of people saying, yeah, but I bet she can't even hit the target. And it used to really irk me because I thought, you know, would they say this to a guy doing this trick? Like, would they, are they just saying it because I'm some blonde girl on a horse, you know, and I probably look like a bimbo to them. And then I heard uh, someone say it really well where they go, you know, you have to kind of feel sorry for those comments, like genuinely feel sorry that they're they're not coming from a place of caring. And it's probably more to do with them than it is to you. It's not that they're critiquing you. It's more that they it might make them feel better to think, oh, well, she didn't even make that shot. And so you, in a way, you have a little bit of empathy for those comments. And I would just say to shrug them off the best you can. Um, sometimes they, you know, not nice comments always hurt a little bit sometimes, but the more you can just laugh at them or, or ignore them, I think that's kind of the best way to handle. Um, I don't usually engage with people that are trying to bring me down. It's just not anything I want in my, in my world. And it's a, it's a bit of a waste of time to engage with those people. But yeah, I, I do know how to shoot my bow. <laughs> That's sometimes I say that, like, well, I just trust that I know how to shoot my bow. I've been doing it for 10 years. <laughs> well, and yeah, the videos are just so cool. They're, they're just really fun to watch, but you can see that you're hitting the target in them. I mean, 
Yeah. And it's like, sure, I miss, but so does everybody. Olympic archers miss sometimes. I mean, Michael Jordan misses his shots sometimes, but um, a lot of times I'm also hitting the target. So, uh, you know, it's one of those things where I go, I can't take it too personally. I just have to go, I know what I'm doing and I have confidence in what I'm doing. And so if people need to bring it down, then that has more to do with them than, than it really has anything to do with me or anything like that. So you, you have a pretty wide background and obviously you're still doing quite a few different things with different horses and different barns and trainers, but what would you say is probably your most favorite thing you're doing right now when you're riding? Yeah. Um, I would say jumping might be my favorite at the moment. And it's probably because it's the thing I have the least amount of access to at the moment. Um, and so I'm a big problem solver. I love solving problems and I like taking on challenges, whether that's challenging horses or challenging projects. And so that's been the newest one for me where uh, I've started training one horse for uh, to be a hunter jumper. And so I'm really enjoying that process. But it's probably my favorite thing is just bonding with any horse. So I don't know if it necessarily has to do with the discipline so much as my experience with that horse. I really love that because I think that relates to a lot of our audience and our listeners and our readers because we all do this because we love our horse. And I know that I have done multiple disciplines and it always comes back to the horse is what matters. And they're the whole reason that I do this in the first place. Absolutely. I mean, the horse that I'm, that I was referencing that we were training to be a hunter jumper, he was a Western horse originally, and then he grew to be a little bit taller and he just moved like a hunter and it's like, well, you know, we have to adapt to our horses too. So you might buy a horse with an intention of being a rainer or a cutter or a jumper. And then you realize, well, they're not really enjoying that. They're not really built for that. What else can we do where they're getting satisfaction and where we're growing together and performing our best. And kind of on that same note, I was having a conversation with a friend the other day about how when we do go to horse shows, like my personal favorite part is being able to demonstrate that bond that I have in the arena where everything could and and will go wrong. Like it's not about just having a perfect ride and sitting there and looking pretty and you know, all that it's, it's, you know, knowing that you have this connection with your horse and that you can do something, you know, like going down the fence or, you know, running barrels or jumping or whatever it is that you do. Absolutely. There's such a level of trust and you can really spot the difference between the people that are, you know, just kind of phoning it in and they go and maybe someone else is in no judgment, but maybe someone else is getting their horse ready and they're going once a week and they're doing it more because they want to be a horse show person. And that's fine. And that has its place too. But I do think there's a big difference between that and seeing someone that's, you know, also riding their horse for fun in addition to training for a competition. And sometimes, you know, it's like we were talking about with Dan's ride. That's where you see the difference is when things go wrong and you have that bond with your horse, you can recover more. There's a really good saying that I like sweat more in practice, bleed less in war. And so by training harder and by practicing more and spending that time at the barn, you know, like Dan always told me that if you have 90% at home, you're going to probably perform at 60%. So you need to have that preparation and that background. And that's just time in the saddle with your horse. Clearly you have a bond with your horse. So, or horses, I should say, tell us a little bit about your horses and the stars of, you know, your Instagram platform. And do you have a favorite one? Do they all kind of have their own little spots in your heart? And I know that I'm personally interested and I want to know more about the stars of the show yeah I oh it's hard to it's hard to pick a favorite because they all have their amazing qualities um but I'll pick maybe the the most frequently posted horses like right now uh the hunter that I was referring to diesel he's the buckskin quarter horse and he's about 16 two hands and he's been the horse that's taught me the most about how to train a horse um and he kind of came with his own set of problems and he's really turned around and you know, in, he made me adapt my training skills. Um, not that I'm a horse trainer, but you know, we're having to train our horses when we're the only ones riding them. And so he made me adapt my skills and kind of extend my knowledge for how to teach him how to do a lead change and, um, really starting from scratch. So he was the greenest horse that I've started. So that's been a really fun journey. And I, I love that horse. He is so quirky. He, he just, 
like he plays with anything. He's nosy. Like, and he, so when we first got him, he would just look at everything. Like he just could not keep his eyes. If he saw a horse, he would just like turn his whole head in his body to look at that horse. And so he's still, he's gotten so much better because he's not as green, but he now just turns like one ear to look at the horse. And you can tell that he's, he's trying to look, but he's trying to be a good boy too. So he's just like, nah, just a little radar of like, it's over there. Um, so I love that horse. The other horse that you see on my social media channels is Windsor. And he is a gypsy cob who belongs to a friend of mine. She actually let me use him for a video shoot. So I was supposed to ride another horse for a video shoot that was on a Sunday. And on Saturday, that horse came up lame. And I had done archery on that horse for years. And so this girl was coming in town to shoot some mounted archery. And I called up my friend Wendy and I said, can I play with Windsor? I know we've only like shot the bow off of him at a standstill and I've only jumped him twice, like ever. And I said, I need to maybe come out today and train him for this big video shoot tomorrow. And so she said, sure, come on out. And so I literally wrote him on Saturday. I desensitized him to the bow really quickly, um, then did uh, some jumping. And then we put it all together on Sunday for the video shoot. So if you see any videos of me wearing a blue shirt and shooting while jumping, that was our, our second time ever doing that. Um, and then after that, we were able to practice more and we were like, oh, he really enjoys this. Like he is just a performer of a horse. Like he absolutely loves to do tricks. Like he does rears on command. He lays down on command. We have a lot of fun with him. We call him Windsor the Great because he is just a complete rock star. And then let's see, we also have Millie. Um, she's probably one of my favorite mares. She's a gypsy vanner and she was the first gypsy that I ever rode. And I always wanted to ride a gypsy growing up. I used to say, oh, look, they have dogs on their feet when I was like a three-year-old because I thought their fluffy feet were so cute. <laughs> and so I saw her, she moved to the barn that I was riding at and I just like immediately fell in love with her. And I was like, oh, I hope someday I can ride her. And her owner ended up going to New Zealand for a month. And she said, hey, you know, I know you've been doing some riding around here. Do you want to ride my horse while I'm gone? And so I got to ride her for the month. And when the owner came back, she said, you did a really good job with her. And you fixed a lot of certain things that I was working on and some of the issues. Like, do you want to continue riding her? And so I was really fortunate. I got to keep riding her and working with her. And we've done archery together. And she lets me launch the drone off of her. And she do, does like bareback jumping with me. Um, she does trail rides. I once got into an accident. And I was like a mile off of the trail. And she brought me back. And then I passed out when I got back to the trailer. So she is like kind of my, my favorite mare for sure. Other than Miss Dreamy, she's, she's my other favorite mare. But so another horse that you probably see uh, me doing a lot of like silly shenanigans on is Duke. And he's a black quarter horse. I think he's about 15. And I started riding him for a friend of mine. She's a very busy um, professional businesswoman. She owns three businesses and she has three horses and she just didn't have quite as much time as she wanted to be riding. And this particular horse, uh, she was kind of thinking like maybe she wasn't going to be able to ride him that much because she had had an accident on him where she fell off and ended up breaking her back. And they, so we used to call him Spooky Duke because he was afraid of everything. He was afraid of his own shadow. He was afraid of birds. He was afraid of bags. He just had zero confidence and it wasn't her fault. It was actually, she, he had been passed around a lot before she got him. Her accident was pretty early on in buying him. And uh, so we do a lot of desensitizing with him. And that's why you see like the soccer ball videos where we're like kicking a soccer ball. And now he's one of my favorite horses to ride. Like I rode him on the trail for our horse and rider shoot um, for the magazine shoot. And he's completely confident. He went in the river. He, uh, I can pretty much do anything with him. I made a video for one of my social channels where I desensitized him to the bow for the first time. And it was really a lot of confidence building. And he really changed my mind about just horses that are a little bit un misunderstood and lack confidence and how they can completely do a 180. So I really love that horse too. Yeah. Duke was a superstar on our trail ride. I He's would so have good. not known that he had the history that he had if you guys hadn't told me because he was, you know, a true pro. Yeah, he's a different horse. I mean, he is just like, he knows he's good now and um, he handles everything that you throw at him. So I, we're really proud of him. And Tina's done a really good job with him too. Just, 
you know, building his confidence and doing some fun groundwork. And so we really love that horse. I mean, he's, I, when I first met him, I was like, I don't know if I want to get on this one. And, and now he's, he's kind of my favorite trail horse to ride. Yeah, no. And, and Tina and uh, Tina and Steve are friends of horse and rider as well. They, they were so nice to let me go riding with you guys. So oh, a big best. shout out. Yeah. A big shout out to them. You and Tina had actually a pretty cool trip last year. You guys went to Japan for something not horse related, but you ended up riding with an Olympic trainer while you were there. Right? Yeah, it, it was crazy. So uh, Tina, Tina travels a ton and everywhere she goes, she always rides. So no matter if she's going to, you know, Colorado or Scotland or uh, you name it, she's always booking a riding trip when she goes. So she invited me to go to um, her nephew's wedding and while we were there, we, and this was in Tokyo, Japan. And so while we were there, she's like, let's, let's find somewhere where we can go for a trail ride. And so she found this Olympic dressage trainer and we got on the horses. We went for a trail ride at the base of Mount Fuji. And then at the end of it, he gave me a dressage lesson and he was not easy. Like he was, he was tough and it was really fun, but it was pretty wild that my first dressage lesson ever was not only in Japan, but it was also with like an Olympic level instructor. So that was, that was a pretty cool and memorable experience. Holy cow. What an experience. So do you have any more exciting adventures coming up, horse related, non-horse related that people can watch for on your social channels? Yeah, absolutely. I, um, well, hopefully, uh, Tina and I have another trip planned for Scotland in September and it's for another wedding, but we're of course going to ride while we're there. And so I think at the moment we have five or six rides planned. So hoping that, you know, hopefully the, all the COVID stuff kind of settles down and we're able to go on that trip, but that should be taking place in September. So we're pretty excited about that. And if it doesn't, then we'll go back next year and, and do our riding trip then. Going, you know, in a different direction, let's talk a little bit about your professional career because you're an artist by trade. Um, you've been painting your whole life, but a lot of your art also involves horses and your your horse life and all that stuff. Do you draw a lot of inspiration from your personal horse life when you are, you know, painting and all that? Definitely. Um, since I've always been riding and painting simultaneously, um, not literally at the same time. I don't paint while I'm writing. <laughs> that would, that would cool. make a that cool would be a Instagram. good trick, right? That'd be a good Instagram <laughs> video, though. You should check it out. I should. I should try that. Um, but yeah, so I, I've been writing ever since I was three, and I've been drawing ever since I was three. Um, and I never stopped. I kept training um, and going to different uh, atelier programs all through, um, starting in high school and then through college and a little after and doing some apprenticeships. So I've I've always known that I wanted to do art as a career but that I always wanted horses to remain in my life. So the two really complement each other because art can be such a, um, a solo project. You know, you're sitting in the studio uh, by yourself and you're focusing on the canvas and it can be a little bit mentally draining. So I always say the riding is the yin to my yang, like riding fills me back up and the art kind of drains a little bit of the creativity out of me. And then I get filled back up by riding. So it was funny while we were in quarantine, I, I noticed that, I'm usually extremely productive in the studio and I'm also riding. And so when we had a few weeks of not being able to ride, I was like not as productive as I usually am with painting. And so it did really reinforce how integral uh, horses are into my creative life. So horses and art obviously go together for you. Do you draw a lot of horse related Western type artwork and what exactly is your artwork? Sure. Yeah, I definitely draw a lot of inspiration um, from the good rides and the bad. I mean, sometimes I paint objects out of nature that I see on trail rides. Like I've been really fixated on butterflies and moths and things that I find out in nature and mixing that with abstract, but more specifically with horses. Um, like last year I had a riding accident and I actually drew a painting based on what had happened. So, uh, and it included a horse and a girl on the ground. So I do do a lot of like representational work as well. So being around horses is really helpful with understanding animal anatomy. So whenever I get a commission, whether it's a horse or a dog, I'm really able to capture their likeness and their expression because I spend so much time around the horses and the animals at the barn. You mentioned earlier that the the art and the horses are kind of the yin to the yang. 
that's a pretty busy schedule. How do you manage to work full time and then stay as active as you are on social media while also just, you know, enjoying your horse life and not, you know, worrying about getting the footage you need for whatever it is that you're working on? Yeah, it can be a lot to juggle, but I am a master planner. So uh, I like to have a bullet journal and I have a master task list and I break that down by month. Um, all the things I'd like to get done within the month and the goals that I have. Uh, And then each week I break it down by week and then by each day. So I kind of have it structured at this point where I know the days and the times that I'm riding. I know what times I'm going to be painting and drawing. And then I might dedicate like one or two days to creating content or sometimes in the evening, but it's just all about like structure and balance. And I've just learned that kind of through trial and error. And I've always been a little bit of a hyper organizer. So it's almost like the more that I have going on, I'm able to be more productive. So it does work really well to have multiple things going on at once. Well, and you're never, you know, bored, that's for sure. (laughs) Never, no. (laughs) I think during quarantine was the first time I've ever been home on a weekend for like an entire day. So uh, that was something to get used to. But I still wasn't bored because there's, there's always stuff to do. Yeah, I should probably take some of your advice being a super planner because I know that Horse and Rider has recently started doing some TikTok and I've been doing the TikTok and between doing regular work and just trying to go to the barn, trying to, you know, come up with that extra content is actually time consuming and really tricky. Yeah, it can be a lot. I think if you just organize your schedule, um, it becomes a little bit more manageable. Like I used to just have one list of things to do like my you know just these are all the things that I need to do and I would not sleep as well at night because I would think oh I um you know I need to get all of this done in a day and then when I started to break it down by week and by day it became a lot more manageable and you can only really get like four to five things done a day yeah no uh Michaela's been doing you know some TikTok for horse and rider because we've been home during this COVID-19 pandemic, you know, the quarantines, normally we would be out on shoots, we would be at events doing all sorts of stuff, but we're kind of stuck at home. So we've been trying to find new ways to be creative. Uh, What have you been doing during your time, you know, during these quarantines and all that? Yeah, I've been seeing your TikToks with Horse and Rider and they're great. I love those. Yeah, I've been doing a little bit of of the TikTok stuff myself, um, but I've actually been working on uh, a new coloring book where I'm taking a lot of the images of like my horseback archery images or some popular trail rides. I even made one of the horse and rider photos that Nicole took. I made that into a coloring book page. And so I'll be putting those up on my website just so that people have something to do while they're at home because so many people are not able to go to their barn right now, but they're missing their horses. So I just thought it would be like a nice little adult coloring book or kids are also welcome to do it. Yeah, and we'll try to figure out a way to share that on our Facebook or our website or something because I have seen the photos that some of the photos that you're using in these and they would be really cool to color and just, you know, especially with people being home right now. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I kind of thought, you know, I I know we all kind of felt a little bit like what should we be doing with this time and helping people and offering something that we're doing and so I offered like free coloring book pages for the first month and it really got a good response. So I thought, well, maybe I'll just put together a little book and that would be something fun for people to do. So where exactly will people be able to find the coloring book and what are your social handles so people can follow you on social media? Yeah, my website is the best place to kind of keep up to date with what's going on um, with my coloring book and my art. So that's uh, alexbowens.com. And my social handles are Alex underscore Bowens, and that's B-A-U-W-E-N-S. Thanks so much for joining us today. I know that our readers, our listeners, the people that follow us on social media really love learning more about you. We got so many emails after we did the profile on you about how interesting it was to have somebody who's doing something different with their horse life. So we really love that. And we're so glad that you could share your story even more on the podcast today. And hopefully we'll be able to convince you to do another Instagram takeover or something sometime soon. But be sure everybody to follow Alex on her social media and check out her art and just all the cool things she's doing right now. And thank you both, Michaela and Nicole, for having me. Uh, Nicole, you did a fantastic job on the Horse and Rider article. And I just want to thank you again for that because it was definitely a dream come true to be on the cover of Horse and Rider. And yeah, I would love to do another Instagram takeover. So I'll, uh, I'll be glad to do that anytime. Thanks again, guys.
And now it's time for our Time to Saddle Up segment where Nicole and myself share our favorite things in the horse industry, whether it's a product, event, or anything else. So, Nicole, what is your Time to Saddle Up this week? Mine is the Dewberry Boots. I It has been really rainy here in Colorado, which I am not complaining about. We need the rain. But that means when I go out into the pasture to get the horse that I ride, I am walking in mud. So so those things have been a huge lifesaver. They're so comfortable. I had them and I've worn them at the World Equestrian Games when we were in the middle of a literal hurricane. Uh, And they're so, so great. They keep all the water out. And I love that I can just hose them off and throw them in the back of my car. And I'm not ruining my really nice cowboy boots. That is really nice. Mine are actually my favorite pair of jeans. I'm very picky on my riding jeans. I think I ride in two pairs of jeans that are different brands, but my favorite, absolute favorite pair are a pair of Cowgirl Tough, Just Tough trousers. And they have that wide leg, so they definitely go over your boots. They're super stylish. They're dark wash. But my favorite, absolute favorite part about these jeans is they're super stretchy. (laughs) So... They fit all the time. The only thing with them is I had did notice that I had to downsize because they do have some stretch. And over time, they stretch a little bit more. But sometimes I'll go to ride and I'll put on a pair of jeans and I'm just not having it. I have to come back in and put those jeans on because they are like my sweatpants of riding jeans. So those are my favorite pair of jeans. And that's my time to saddle up for this episode. Thank you guys for tuning into the Ride Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode and please be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Follow Horse and Rider Magazine on social media and find us at horseandrider.com. If you guys have any questions or comments, please be sure to hit us up at horseandrider at aimmedia.com. We want to hear from you guys. And if you like what you're listening to, be sure to leave us a review on iTunes. How many stars, Michaela? Five stars, please.